All right, well, first, uh, uh, welcome. I guess before we begin, I'll just do a just quick um, little background. Um, I'm Jesse Sutton. I am the uh, vice president of the SCA. And before we get started uh, with the rabbi, uh, and I introduce the rabbi, I want to just quickly um, let everybody know that with everything that's been going on in recent events in Israel and the horrors that we've all seen and now that we've seen these crazy um, responses on college campuses, I want to make a note that the, um, the SCA has been addressing uh, these issues with our young adults for years now. And we have a young adult division of the SCA. And you know we've brought in countless speakers like Brooke Goldstein of the Lawfare Project, Hussein Abu Bakr as a pro-Israel activist, Avi Posen from Open Door Media, Rabbi Meir Salavechik from Tikva.org. Noah Tishbi has come on a couple of times, actually. And, it's, and of course, we have uh, our boot campus to, to culminate everything, on a, which is an annual retreat for three days where we take seniors from all of our community schools and we select about 50 or so of them. And we basically take them on a three-day trip where we focus on Israel, anti-Semitism, Supported Jewish heritage and pride, uh, social media literacy, um, and all of the issues that are going on at college campuses to prepare our seniors before they head to college. Um, we're really on that note, and really in that context, I want to introduce Rabbi Yotav Eliach. Um, the rabbi uh, has the rabbi is uh, has been a television and political and military analyst in, on I-24 from 2018 to 2020. Uh, he's the author of um, what I consider a definitive book of um, Judaism, Zionism, and the Land of Israel. Uh, it's a 4,000 year religious, ideological, and historical story of the Jewish nation. Um, we'll get into that a little bit in a minute, but this is just, in, in my opinion, and so take it for what it's worth, uh, this is a book that's required reading in my home, and I think should be in every single home, besides being in every school. Um, alongside being an author, um, the rabbi and I go back uh, uh, a little ways. Um, the rabbi was, when he was um, uh, an uh, instructor and administrator at the Yeshiva of Flatbush from 1979 to 1999, I had the privilege, and I really call it a privilege, um, that uh, Rabbi Aliyah was uh, my teacher, uh, a couple of years actually, um, and uh, was an inspiration to the way that I love and care and and want to be so much a part of the story that is Am Yisrael and Medina Yisrael. And um, I think that uh, many of us uh, older students, Rabbi, will say that you are a very important part of the reason we came to school every day. Was to, experience, was to experience your class and to not only be inspired, but really have an incredible learning experience overall. The rabbi is, um, uh, has been in education practically his whole life. Uh, he's a, currently the principal for the, over the last 20 years at the Rambam Masifta High School in Lawrence, New York. He currently serves as a volunteer in the IDF Reserves Infantry, Police, Border Patrol, and Security Forces. The rabbi Rabbi uh, has his uh, BA in, from Brooklyn College in History and uh, Middle Eastern Studies. And then, ironically, somewhat ironic, Rabbi, that you have your master's degree in international politics from NYU. And I think that's a, a good jumping off point. First of all, you've also been a public speaker since 1978 on all things Israel. And on, on, on that, I, I, I say welcome. And um, we're really excited to, uh, to have you uh, on our program tonight. Thank you. I'm very excited and, ha and happy and pleased to be here. So I guess, you know, the best thing we can do is talk about the letter, as it's now being called. The, uh, uh, the letter that is running around all of our chats that, has, uh, that you wrote um, after receiving a request uh, from New York University for early decision from your school to, to, to meet with applicants, etc. Um, you had a very strong response to them 
And um, I guess, you know, what were you feeling when you wrote that letter? Uh, I guess one of the things that, that comes to mind is it's not really a new problem. Our college campuses have been run overrun by students and faculty that have called for the, the end of the Jewish state of Israel and the Jewish demise as a whole. Um, from the river to the sea is unfortunately an old slogan on college campuses. What made this time different? You know, I'm, I'm going to take you to the present and I'm going to take you back close to, if not more than 40 years. In the present, the truth is, uh, I, I, to a great extent, uh, for better or for worse, I ignore a lot about things that happen on college campuses because to a great extent, it is an alternate universe. If you look at society as a whole, though things have changed, over the last literally four or five years, ideas that were localized and left in the college campus about religion, about sexuality, about uh, about um, class warfare and things of that nature, all of those crazy ideas, uh, intersectionality, etc., were in their realm, but they bled out to the entire United States of America culturally, politically, etc. Now add to that, that that Israel is fighting its real first war in 50 years, a real declared war by the government and the state of Israel, everything else we have, even the first and second Lebanon wars were not declared wars. And we only called the partial reserves and the rules of engagement for the Israeli army are very different when there's a war and when there's an operation. And this is also the first time in 50 years that all the reserves were called up. This has not, not happened since the Yom Kippur War. So in the context of Israel fighting a war, a war that began with a massacre, and I don't mean a massacre, I think you all know, but it's important to spell out. It's not five people, it's not 10 people, it's not 15 people, it's 1400 people. It was a mini Holocaust. The, I mean, I, I don't suggest most of you should watch and see what I've seen. I've seen things both that the vicious enemy has filmed, and I've seen things that the IDF has released within inner circles and friends of mine have sent to me. Uh, the butchery, the, the, the sickness, the depravity of their behavior and their actions it's not like Nazis, it is Nazis. And we have to stop, it's not like, it is. I don't think any SS, Einsatzgruppen, the ones who did the open air killings or SS who worked in concentration camps could, you know, would, could take a back seat to some of the things that these very sick, perverse, anti-Semitic men did in that first day on this October 7th, which was uh, Shemini Atzeret. And then to watch on television or on the internet predominantly for me, these clips of students all over, but in particular in NYU, which is you know like 25 miles from where I live, I live in Long Island. This, you know, in, it's not chic, it's not revolutionary. You're basically siding with people who are massacring, killing, annihilating my people, and that's their goal. And so you may think it's a clever euphemism from the river to the sea, but it's basically saying the same thing as shove me into an oven. River to the sea simply means to annihilate the state of Israel and their behavior, their mass raping, their dismemberment of bodies, killing children in front of parents, parents in front of children, torturing, but I'm talking medieval tortures done, and then you're supporting that, and you're behind that, and you have faculty that do that, and the school like seems to be ambivalent, like, hmm, how do we respond to this? Stop and think for a minute. If there was something remotely, remotely close to a black group, to an LBGTQ group, Imagine if somebody just left the noose someplace or took an LGB flag and ripped it in public, what type of response the university had? 
This is 1,400 Jews massacred, beheaded, gang raped, really horrific things. They demonstrate, they scream and yell. To me, it was like a university in 1943-44, basically having a pro-Nazi demonstration and the administration being ambivalent, like, well, what do we do here? You know, it's, uh, on one hand, it's free speech, and on the other hand, it may not be so nice. It, I had it. I'm sick of it. Enough of this. And it happens to be on that day, they send me a letter. So I responded. But there's also a back page to all of this, if you can indulge me. Please. I was involved in an incident, I believe it was 1977, I went to Brooklyn College. I had come back from uh, a year in Israel. I was in Yeshiva Gush Etzion, was a Hezder Yeshiva. And in the days that I went, uh, there was no American programs. We were with the Israelis. It was two years after the Yom Kippur War. Eight guys from the Yeshiva had been killed. The roommates, my friends were, were predominantly Israeli. The guys who woke me up every morning were five years older than me but were all veterans of the Yom Kippur War and had lost one third of the seniors from their high school class. So that's the environment that I was in. And it was a very powerful year to me. I went to a funeral of one person killed by terrorists. I went to another funeral, somebody killed in a training accident. Uh, it, it was, it was uh, probably the most impactful year of my life. So I come back to the United States, I go to Brooklyn College. A year after I'm back, this is at the time that the PLO was the leading terrorist group in the world and certainly the leading Arab terrorist group. So they came to Brooklyn College and they set up a table with PLO flags and all this literature about Zionism, colonialism, imper imperialism, apartheid wasn't the cool word yet, but imperialism was there, colonialism, the, um, the crusader-like state. Now, it happens to be, as a major in Middle Eastern studies, I was in Arabic classes. I was in Islamic history classes. I was in classes about the Quran. So more than half my classes were Arabs and Muslims. So I'm looking and I see that this demonstration is being led by guys that I know. They're in some of my classes, they're not my buddies. And at that time, Brooklyn College must have had 18,000 Jews. And in the middle of the campus, this is after the Ma'alot massacre of 74, the, uh, the hijacking of the plane in Entebbe, the Lod massacre in 72, the 1973 killing of the, uh, 72 killing of the, uh, of the athletes. It was the PLO had their hands soaking in blood and they were terrorists, and they're, they're on my campus, and they're handing out all this literature, and all the Jewish kids don't know what to do with themselves. I'm still wearing my little bomber jacket that I had from Yeshiva in Israel, and my Israeli knitted yarmulke, and I walk right into the middle of this demonstration. They had about four or five tables, and it was Arab students, Islamic students, third world students, and Yotav walking in the middle. And I walk in very calmly. And today I wouldn't because they're much more violent than they were then. I walked in and I start picking up literature. Zionism is imperialism. Yeah, I think I'd like that one. Zionism is colonialism. That's good. The Nakba, I pick up that as well. And I'm literally collecting literature. Everybody's looking at me the Arab students, the Muslim students, the third world students, like what is, what is this guy's, what's his story? What does he want? Is he crazy? Is he here? What, what's, what does he want? So I noticed that one of the guys behind the table was handing out the literature was a guy I knew from class. His name was Ali. So I looked at him and I held up all the literature in my hand. Remember, this is 1977, this is a while back. It gives you an insight as to how I think and what I believe and how I've been living my life. And I look at him and everybody's around me. I wasn't talking to Ali. That's a point that's important. 
I'm not talking to somebody who's steeped and believes in this. Don't waste your time on the internet fighting with somebody who's a jihadist. If there's 50 people watching or 100 people, yeah, maybe I can make a point. Maybe somebody will listen to what I have to say. I look at him and I say, do you believe in all this literature that we're Zionist, colonialist, imperialist, and that we're crusaders and that we don't belong here and we should be sent back to Europe? And yeah, yeah, yeah. I go, okay, okay. And remember, I'm there with my yarmulke and I'm surrounded. I said, I have an idea for you. You're sitting here in Brooklyn College and what you're doing is you're upsetting 18,000 Jews. And I got to tell you, you're doing a great job. People are crying. This is 1977. People are crying, people upset because we, the PLO flag to us is massacres, killing Jews, hijacking planes, really bad stuff. They don't know what to do. People are traumatized. I said, you've gained, you know, I got to give you some credit. You've, certainly the shock value is really good. But I said, Ali and all your buddies, that's not what you really want, I assume. I said, what you really want to do is to liberate occupied Palestine. Isn't that what you want to do? And I said, I tell you what, being on the Brooklyn College campus, that's not good enough. And at this point, people really think I've lost my mind. I said, I don't know the exact address, but I suggest you and your buddies hop a flight to Beirut. And I, I think in the southern, the southwestern part of Beirut, I know that the Palestinian refugee camps are there. That's the headquarters of Fatah and the PLO. If you come and say that you want to join Fatah, Fatah is the terrorist arm of the PLO, you'll probably get anywhere from 10 to 12 weeks of training to be what they call in Arabic Fedayin, which is a freedom fighter, which is terrorist in my book. I said, you know, and after 12 weeks of training, you and your buddies will make your way to southern Lebanon. And on the other side of the border will be Occupy Palestine. And you'll be there with your AK-47 and probably a lot of grenades. And you'll be all trained to, remember, I'm a Jewish kid with a yarmulke. And I'm telling him what to do. And I said, but there's one thing, Ali, that I think you really, really need to understand. When you cross that border and you think that we're going to follow the script in this literature, that's your biggest mistake. We're not colonialists. We're not imperialists. And we ain't the crusaders. You're going to be meeting my friends. And my friends, this is our home. This is where we live. This is where our ancestors live. This, and we are going to be, my friends will be protecting their moms, their dads. And if they're older, their children, their wives, their property, and everything that's holy to them. That's who you're going to be meeting. And every single one of them will do everything in their power to help you die for your cause. I said, you think about that and have a good day. And that began an entire debate. And, and, and I, I think I handled myself quite well. What, what, and I just. What, why, why were you not? It's interesting that, and you brought it up a little earlier, you touched on it. Why, why weren't you afraid? Uh, physically for your own physical I think at that time right? they weren't as violent as they are today or as bloodthirsty uh, and I knew some of them knew me personally I'm also I mean I I considered myself if you know if somebody puts their hand on me I will be prepared to put my hand on them as well I don't think they're all going to jump me I don't think they were carrying knives or guns or anything like that it's a different mood than today I think today they're more violent and I would use the word even psychotic. But honestly, if there were 20, 30 Jewish kids who, who were pretty self-confident and, 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 and feel, feeling that they know what they're doing, I think in theory there could be a phalanx of Jewish kids. But today the police are in your way because the, there were no police there. This is, the, the reality was different. I just felt it was important for me to let them know this is not a game. This is not a coffee parlor game and the entire script that you wrote for me and my people is a false one and nothing has changed nothing has changed in 46 47 years and if i could go one step beyond 
Jesse, what you asked me, and this is something very important for the audience to understand. The, the reason the Mufti, who was the leader of the Arabs in mandated Palestine from 1921 till 1948, who was a Nazi, he met with Hitler in 1943. There are pictures. There is an entire document that, that, um, that uh, commemorates the exact words between yeah. him and Hitler. And he, was, he put together the Hanshar division, which was a division of Bosnian Muslim SS soldiers. He was a Nazi. And then his successor at the end is Arafat. And then after Arafat, Abu Mazen. And then you have Hamas, etc. They all make the same huge mistake. We both pay for it, but it's a mistake that at the end, in my opinion, will finish them. Their mistake is they've come up with a delusion as to who they're fighting, that they're fighting colonialists, imperialists, etc. Which means I'm going to Kenya and I'm going to kick out the British. I'm going to France, uh, to Morocco, and I'll kick out the French. But that's not what they're doing. What they're doing is they're going to England to try to kick out the English. Good luck with that. You're going to France and you're trying to kick out the French from France. Good luck with that. And we're much more tenacious than they are because of our history, religiously, historically. They literally don't understand what they're doing. What they did on October 7th, besides being something that will probably remain on the Jewish calendar for centuries, and in Israel and, and, and in the diaspora, it will ruin, it will ruin which Miniatzeret means for a long, long time. But on the other hand, they lit a fire in the soul of Israelis from left to right, from secular to religious, the Haredi, to those who have pay us down to here, the guys whose heads are shaved and are full of tattoos. Everybody is focused on one thing. Everybody is focused on one thing. You try to annihilate the Jewish people and you will pay a heavy price for this. In a, in a bizarre way, especially after the eight, nine months of, you know, interpolitical fighting that Israel had, everything was dropped on the side and everybody understands who the real enemy is. And what they've just done now is they've opened up the doors to a fate that in their worst nightmare, they haven't imagined. It's all the same mistake. The Mufti made this mistake. Uh, Arafat made this mistake. Every time they do this, and, and it's almost the definition of insanity. The definition of insanity is trying the same tactic that doesn't work, and you try it again and again and again. You know that the army didn't call up 350,000 soldiers. Called up a little bit more than 200,000. 350,000 showed up. They didn't call that number. And you know how many thousands of Israelis showed up from all over the planet and they're still streaming into the country, whether they were traveling in the jungles of the Amazon or Central America or India or Thailand or Cambodia, wherever they were, everybody, everybody was on planes. They're either in uniform or on their way back. They don't get who we are, what we are. So this, this particular time that, that really drove the response that you gave to NYU, this was more about, this is like the, the straw that broke the camel's back. This was something that was building for years, a, 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 an event as horrific as this happens and it exposes, basically it exposes the level of the level of, of anti-Semitic rhetoric and, 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 and vicious hatred that a lot of, a lot of these students were, when you see the, the nature of their, even looking at their faces, their intensity, is there's, there, there's something there that, that is uh, uh, disturbing, to be honest. Would you say that it was just a, a, a very large straw that broke the camel's back? Yes. And I think it's important to notice, to note rather, that that intent 
intensity of knowledge they have comes from indoctrination. It comes from learning a completely false and bizarre history of the Arab-Israeli conflict, of who the Jews are, who the Arabs are, history, politics, religion, and somebody inculcating absolute lies after lie after lie, in course after course, in, in workshop after workshop, in, 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 a, in a bizarre alternate universe that at the end, what, they, what they're doing now, you know, there's no more pre pretenses. I think the average American who was near a college campus before this week didn't know what the river to the sea meant. Now, people like me and Jesse, I assume like you, we know exactly what that meant. The river to the sea is a euphemism to wipe Israel off the map. And I don't know what percentage of the population got it. I'd say under 1%. But after October 7th, when you saw, and I have to keep repeating what they did because it's important, you massacred, you slaughtered, you gang raped, you mutilated, you beheaded, you, you burnt people alive, you tortured people. And the last time this was done to us was in the Holocaust. And then we have people in the United States of America, predominantly, predominantly on college campuses, but not exclusively, demonstrating total support for the people that did this. We are now, we're, we're in a different place right now. And I mentioned that in my letter. It's no longer, we have different opinions, we have different perspectives. It's not about opinions and perspectives. It's 1943. You wanna round me up and send me to the gas chambers, and to the ovens, and that's not a different perspective. That is a vile threat to my existence, and that's what the response has to be. That's that's fair. I, I, I what what's been what's been the response to the letter itself? Uh, from our perspective, my perspective, I've I've had the opportunity to hear a lot of feedback and and see a lot of feedback, mostly positive, mostly super positive. But some pushback as well, that these are our advanced education colleges. Our students work really, really hard to get into them for higher education. Should we be shutting them out? What would be the, 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 the proper, or in your opinion, what would be the way to go about this rather than just eliminate them completely? Or is that the only so, uh, option? I'm, I, I'm speaking now as a private citizen. I am not speaking as the principal of my school. I'm not speaking as a community leader. I'm speaking as Yotav Eliach, myself, who, you know, with my feelings and my background. By definition, anytime you do something that is drastic in order to protect your family or your country or your people, there will be collateral damage. And by definition, there will be a change and perspective of what's important and what's not important. I'll give you silly examples for this generation. For my generation, it was very real. Being not just of Ashkenazic stock on my mother's side, my, my father was Yerushalmi for six generations, but before that, Eastern Europe, and before that, Israel as well. All my friends growing up were Holocaust survivors. Their parents were Holocaust survivors. I learned Yiddish that way because all my friends' parents spoke Yiddish. The Holocaust is something that was constantly present in my life. I had no friends that owned German cars, including our house. I had no friends that any German items were allowed to be brought into the house. It wasn't a discussion. No Mercedes Benz, no BMW, no Audi, nothing, not Bosch washing machines, zero. Nothing. It was understood. We want nothing. For, are these good items? They're good items. Are the cars that they bought instead of worse? Probably worse. But that's like, who cares? That's a small price. And it's a small price to pay to basically say, I want nothing to do with these people because of what they did, who they are, etc. Now, when it comes to higher education, first of all, I think the question we have to ask ourselves is this exactly higher education? What exactly are you teaching? Are you telling me that NYU is turning out brilliant people who have an understanding of civilization, of math, 
science, history, humanities, ma engineering history, I doubt that's exactly who they're turning out, certainly in their liberal arts department. And it's not as if, and I know they have a great filming, uh, a, a film school, et cetera, but thank God this country has 5,000 universities. And I think we have, we have to take a step back and say, listen, if this, I, I'll give you an analogy before I continue. It's 1937, I'm Jewish, and the University of Berlin has the best physics department, because if you all saw the movie Oppenheimer, then you all know that some of the world's greatest physicists did come from Germany and lectured in German universities. But I'm a Jew. So do I say to myself, okay, on one hand, I'm going to get the greatest education in the world if I go to University of Berlin because such great physicists, but I'm going to be in the heart of Nazi Germany in a school that espouses Nazism. So maybe I go someplace else where the physics department may not be as strong. Maybe I even go to another country, in this case, Caltech or whatever. But because you know what? I'll pay the price of not being in a Nazi university. Well, okay. Let me, let, let me ask you this, Reverend. Yeah. Is, there, is there a response that the college colleges that have been um, allowing this kind of, and in some cases really supporting it with some of their faculty, this kind of behavior on their campuses from some of those students, is there a response that they can have now, you know, or in the near future that, you know, creates policies? You, were, you talked earlier about how some of the um, other uh, minorities or other people that are in uh, the, that have that have these rules right against um, discriminating against them in any capacity where there's real consequences if students go about to, you know, doing things like that how, how would is there is there is there a solution from that perspective the, the way I see it again I'm speaking as a private citizen by definition when something is very important to you and you're willing to take I guess, drastic measures, you know, we're, we're not going to go riot and burn down cities. And we're not going to go and threaten them that we're going to blow up their universities or take their statues and topple them down. We have our own style. And the style goes like this. At some universities, it may hurt, some it may not, but it's certainly going to be food for thought. So number one, a lot of us probably go to a lot of these private universities and we're not exactly on tuition assistance. So the answer is, we're not coming anymore. We're not going, okay? So whether it's 10% at Princeton or 7%, uh, whatever the case may be, have a nice stay. You're losing that. Number two, you got a lot of Jewish donors. Go to a lot of these schools, look at the names of the buildings, look at the names of the endowments, etc. We put our foot down and say, we've really had enough of this. I'm not toppling anything down. I'm not burning anything up. I'm just taking my money out. And I'm not, and, and don't bother sending me letters anymore for donations. It's over. That is, is going to get somebody's attention. I know NYU owns real estate and owns half of Manhattan. I get it. I know it. And probably it won't affect them so much, but even them, it's going to hurt. If suddenly all Jewish money, if Jewish money is pulled out, the answer is that we're going to play, in my opinion, we should play hardball in our own way. Here's our list of demands. These are the things that we want changed about how you speak about Judaism and how you speak about Zionism and how you speak about the Jewish state and how you speak about Jews and how you speak about Zionists. If you don't change your language, and here are some definitions from, you know, for, uh, from the UN, for the United States State Department, of what these terms are, if this doesn't change, we're gone, we're out, our money's out, and we're out. Okay, so I think it's so that's yeah. yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, so I, 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 I was so that so that's 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 really because you're hearing a lot of that now, right? Some of the largest philanthropists in the world people who are some, run some of the largest companies in the world, like uh, Mark Rowan of Apollo Group, 
you know, that, that taking his money out of uh, of uh, of uh, Penn, um, or at least saying that he's you know telling people no longer to to give their money there. Um, he's definitely, uh, I think, um, expressive of that approach. And I, the the so I guess there's, there's two sides. The two there's two parts to this. One is just simply saying, look, I don't want to be a part of an institution that has that uh, uh, in it as part of its DNA. The other side is, well, not the other side, but an alternative is to say, look, you know, we, we, we have been sending students to your school for decades, um, many, many decades. And the, the school has developed a approach towards Israel and Jews and Judaism and treat, and, and, and that, that is just unacceptable. And here is like, you just described, changing some of that language, making real changes on campus, changing real policies. That's a approach as well. Okay. All right. So, so, so I guess, you know, um, when you, when, it, there's no question that the, 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 the letter that you sent has had a tremendous um, impact because people are talking about it all over the place. And uh, where do we go from here, I guess? Where do we go from here? You know, I think, you know, I think the letter that I wrote is part of a much broader picture. And the, big, the bigger picture is what we're witnessing with this war going on. You know, college, what's going on in college campuses is simply one manifestation of what I think is a much larger problem. The one Jew state on planet earth was attacked and invaded on October 7th in a very personal medieval perverse way and the goal was very clear it was a Islamo Nazi pogrom slash mini holocaust and that's exactly what the goal was now the world now is divided into two parts it's the world is divided do you stand with the country that is now responding to annihilate and defeat the group the terrorist organization that carried this raid out this mini holocaust well planned this horrible pogrom or do you stand with that group now if if you stand with that group, this to me is like World War II. Are you with the Nazis? Are you against the Nazis? There's not much middle. I don't believe in equivocating with certain things. I know not all Germans were Nazis. That's true. That's true. And not everybody in Gaza is Hamas. But first of all, a war is not against everybody in Gaza. If it was, their casualties would be 100,000 dead at this point. And, and by the way, the, the media is very careful never to tell you how many, what percentage of the Gazans who are dead is Hamas. If I had to guess, based on earlier operations that we've had, I would say 50% or more of those killed are terrorists, which is an, an incredible kill ratio. If you look at the American army in Iraq or Afghanistan, which is a very careful army, as opposed to, let's say, the Russian army or even the Ukrainian army, trying to minimize civilian casualties. They've had 15 days now, 16 days, tons of warnings. I know Hamas wants to use them as human shields, whatever the case may be, that's their style. But in the world, in my opinion, there's a division now. Are you a moral idiot or not? You wanna tell me that soldiers of Israel, you have, you of videotapes of us raping uh, Muslim women? Show them to me, please. You have videos of us beheading Arab babies? Please show them to me. You have videos of our soldiers going in, sitting down, Gazan families, and pulling out and sawing off body parts in front of each other? Really? Show them to me. I'd like to see them. Because I got videos of what the other side did. So, and we are still pulling our punches big time. We're giving people time to go to this safe zone. So the world is divided now. 
And that means it's not just, just about college and in, in college campuses. Is where do you stand in this struggle? Are you with the Islamo fascist Hamas, Islamic Jihad, Hezbollah? I'm not going to name every single one of the terrorist groups and their the granddaddy who runs them all, which is Iran? Or are you on the side of good Israel and the countries that back Israel for now? United States, Britain, France, Germany, etc. Where do you stand in this struggle? Fellow Americans, whether you're a politician, whether you're a professor, whether you're a person that has you're writing for a newspaper or you're an anchor on a TV station, I want to know where you stand on all of this. Or if you're a doctor that writes on Facebook, you know, I, 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 I'm so glad that, um, you know, that, that, that the freedom fighters finally gave the occupiers a taste. Yeah, you know, we need to fight back. And I'm on all sorts of chats group. Yeah, we're getting doctors fired. That's right. This, this, is, not, this is not a game. This is a war. This is a war. And in my opinion, all of us have our part to make sure, not just that we win in Israel, but that we win everywhere with this war. So- so I think, you know, so many people here in, 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 in our community, and I know all Jewish communities around the world, are so upset on so many levels about all the events on December 7th, on Shemini Yatzeret, on October 7th, I'm sorry. And um, I, I'm, I'm definitely personally inspired by having seen um, our community, so many communities, but speaking on behalf of our community, just doing everything that they possibly can to help uh, in any way, everything from sending containers filled with merchandise um, that's 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 very needed to now you know organizing solidarity trips to name a few. What else can we be doing now and in the future? I think there's a long list. I mean, first of all, I think what your community is doing is remarkable. I'm very proud of my community. I live in the five towns. I'm exceptionally proud of what they've been doing as well. Um, uh, I think the things that we need to continue doing, and first of all, we need to put pressure on the media that's lying. When we have facts, and all you have to do is go to Israeli sources. You can listen to the IDF spokesman. You can go on Israeli websites, whether it's the Jerusalem Post, whether it's the Times of Israel, it's all in English, whether it's Arut Sheva, and you can go to IDF spokesman and you can get facts like what happened with the hospital a day like a week ago that is pure evil it's evil it's evil for a newspaper or anybody that calls themselves a journalist to report several seconds after this happened that this was allegedly an israeli attack and 500 people were killed the actual number of killed was anywhere between 10 and 20 and it clearly was the rocket from Islamic Jihad, and we have all the proof from pictures, yeah. from drones, and from um, communications between Hamas terrorists among themselves, and the pictures of the of the lack of the crater, the, the, the munitions that we use, and what they use. America, it's, America has as well. America as well has already very clearly said this is not from Israel; it's from them. We have to contact. You know, I'll tell you something. I think it's going on in the public school world that you should be aware. As a yeshiva principal, I'm on a list of non-public school principals. I get the same resources that all the principals in New York State get. So I got a kit how to deal with the conflict in the Middle East. Every resource they gave me was an anti-Israel resource, not a moderate. And the other side has worked real hard to get their books in, their videos in, their narrative. It's all not neutral. It's horrendously anti-Israel. And then the only part of thing they mentioned was, we are sorry for the loss of life on both sides. So I wrote them a letter as well. And I wrote to my local politicians who are beginning to pounce on this. And that's another thing to do your principals to take a look at these letters, or if you have anybody in your community who is a public school teacher, they all got the same email from the Department of Education, how to deal with the conflict. And it makes it sound like Tweedledee-Dee is fighting with Tweedledee-Dum. 
we're twiddly dumb. And the truth is, if you look carefully, we're probably worse than twiddly, you know, because of all the occupation and apartheid, which is in the resources that they give you. And they're comparing, they don't talk about the massacres, the raping, etc. They They feel bad about the loss of life of both sides. So A, we should be sending letters and emails to our politicians, our state assemblymen, our state senators, this is local. Your city councilmen, this is the Department of Education. It's unacceptable. We're not living in a Muslim, Arab, jihadist state. I'm sorry, that's not the way you teach students to deal with the war. It would be as if somebody in 1943 was sending out information to the public schools Yes, you know, there were Americans who were killed, but, then, you know, Germans were killed as well. And we have some information here from the German Ministry of Propaganda by Goebbels that we think we'd like you to read. They'll give you a better understanding of the, of the German truth, of the Germans' view of history. I don't think that would be acceptable. So that's one thing we could certainly do. Every now and then we see pictures of stores that talk about boycott Israel. I've been on these chats like fire, boom, we're gonna boycott you. That's another thing we could do. We should also be holding our politicians feet to the fire. For those who are helping us, send them letters. You know, whether it's Schumer or Gillibrand, which as, as an individual, I have my problems with both of them, but I'm sending them emails to thank them. And at least they're stepping up. The other communities, the anti-Israel community, because there is the um, the, uh, the the anti-Israel socialist, you know, gang is growing. Okay, it, it's it, it it ends up being close to twenty congressmen who are in there, and they're growing that group, and they're very powerful in the grassroots. So these elected officials need to hear from us when there's pro-Israel rallies like there were at Times Square. It was good that we had large numbers over there as well. We have to not, we have to look at every aspect of this struggle, the political, the economic, the social, and of course is the educational. And I'll, I'm gonna be very blunt here. I've been teaching the significance and history of Israel from a Jewish perspective since 1981, formally and informally since 1978. In the introduction to my book, I write that sadly, most American Jews who went to yeshiva who are under the age of 40 received zero formal education about what Israel Zionism means from a Jewish historical perspective. They get their news from college when they go there. They get their news from YouTube. They get their news from TikTok. They get their news from all sorts of websites that are so polluted with nonsense. If you don't have education and you don't know the background and what's happening now, everybody wants a quick fix. You know, you know, I need to build an atom bomb. Can you guys teach me physics, enough physics for me to build a bomb? No, actually you need a BA in physics, probably a master's in physics, probably a PhD, and then probably you could sit in the lab and work with people on an atomic weapon. We need, this is, should be a wake up call our high school students, our college students, and overwhelmingly around the country, our deers caught in headlights. They don't know the history of the Arab Israeli colony. They don't know the history of Zionism. They don't know Jewish so, history. So, I mean, Rabbi, you're, 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 um, you're, uh, you're seeing the hour tune from that perspective. I think right. that's what the SEA, has, as, as you know, has been right. focused on for the last bunch of years. I think that's, that, that's been a critical element um, and we've been partnering with our schools, and the schools have been, um, you know, really interested in, in, in do this is, you know, I, I would say there's definitely a little bit of a, you know, it, it, the amount and the, and the level and the intensity with which campuses have now gotten to, even before this horrific event, um, has been developing, as you know, for a long, long time. And I think that, you know, we've been focusing on, on you know, building as much uh, awareness 
Um, and, and there's some fantastic speakers and books and, and, and people that have experienced the credible things that can share um, their, their perspective with our students and I think educate them accordingly like you've, like you've laid out. I guess, you know, there, one thing, I, 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 two things I'll take out, take from what you just said. One is that there's a lot of work for us to do and we need to get a little more, um, get a little more hands on with it. Not just educate ourselves, but to get out there speak to our um, political representatives, uh, do what we can, you know, and I think that also, you know, creates a little conf a lot of confidence to, to uh, for me in the system, the American system. There is something there that, of course, you know, we all have our, we, we, we have our history, but there's also a sense uh, that we do live in a wonderful country and that uh, the American, uh, the foundation of America that, that, that it's been built on um, does have the uh, capability uh, of allowing us to respond in the way you just described. And I think there's, there's, something, uh, there's something, you know, to be taken from that. That's one. And I think the second thing is, is that I think all of us, especially all of us that, that feel the way we all do about um, Eretz Yisrael and Medinat Yisrael, and I'm Israel. We have a tremendous confidence that as Ratashem, we're going to win and we're going to win decisively, and that we're going to weather the storm and we're going to be the better for it. Um, you know, I think when this is all done, where do you see us placing our energy, or where should we be placing our energy from there, in your perspective? Well, first of all, I agree with the point that you made about the United States and and that our uh, ability to live the lives that we have and channels that we have open to us to to change things politically, etc. But I, I I do want to point out something that I think is very important. Uh, I this, this is not going to be a quick war, and and I think that before we talk about what's going to be post-war, I really believe that this war may go on. For, for could be two months and 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 a lot of things may happen in that two months that will require us to be mentally and 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 emotionally strong and not back down and not be afraid because I have a feeling that the opposition to us is going to grow it's not going to shrink and I think we need to be prepared to be able to stay at the same level of intensity that we're at right now for a relatively long period of time, considering I don't think Israel's ever had to fight this type of war since the 1948 War of Independence. This is a different type of war. The enemy is a different type of enemy. The war is on the battlefield. The war is in social media. The war is in regular media. Uh, the war is in going to be on college campuses. It's going to be economic warfare. Um, so, you know, I, I don't want to look past the war right now because I think there are going to be seismic changes historically in the course of this war that we have to weather. I think we, during the war, have to spend, I know the boot camps that you were talking about, we're going to have to arrange a lot of those during this time period. Maybe there's not enough time to get people to go to a retreat, but they're going to have to be, you know, three hour sessions here on a Sunday and three hour sessions on another Sunday and maybe take one, one evening. There's a lot of work that we have to do to prepare both adults who are in the business place. And we're doing that in my community, how to respond to the questions of your coworkers, et cetera. One of the things I did last week, two weeks ago rather, one of my former students from Flatbush, who's a partner in a large law firm, found that most of the members of the law firm actually were pro-Israel just on their gut reaction to October 7th. But they knew nothing about the conflict. So I spent a few hours with them because they only got 45 minutes to speak. So I helped them prepare a 45 minute presentation that really went over well. For lawyers, I, I gave them documents. I gave them the PLO covenant. This is what that side believes, which is a horrible, 
anti-Semitic document. Then I gave them the Hamas charter that makes the PLO charter look nice, which is more medieval. Then I gave them the Israeli Declaration of Independence that talks about extending our hand in peace. And I said, just tell these lawyers, these are three documents that are fundamental to explaining what each side believes. This is what the PA believes. This is what Hamas believes. So I don't, I don't care what their spokesmen say on TV that lie to a Western audience. This is their, this is their core principles, all about annihilating the Jewish state. The Jews are not a people. The Jews have to be destroyed. It's an Islamic waqf. You know, quoting from the Quran on the on the Hamas charter, using secular sources, the Jews have no connection to the land. And then you read the Israeli Declaration. The lawyers were floored. They were yeah. floored. So yeah. there, we're going to have to do stuff like that in our workplaces with our business partners. You know, in in colleges and, and in graduate schools, and we're going to have to do that as this continues, as this continues. I think that's I think that's excellent advice. I guess on that note, it's been an hour. I could probably talk to you for about thirty-two hours, but um, I think uh, we're going to wrap this up. I really, really am so grateful. Really, so grateful for um, for uh, for uh, having you, for you coming and 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 sharing your points of view and and giving us your your insights and 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 your your wisdom on this entire situation it's it's uh from a personal perspective it's terrible that this is what has brought you and i together after not having not having uh having you know, lived our own lives for the last 40 years and 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 done our own thing but uh nevertheless it is great to see you um, Same here. and um and i i just look I, i'll say that um you know we um i think every i think nothing's ever going to be the same um for for better uh, hopefully, all, mostly for better. And uh, from that, you know, we hope that we can all be the better for it. Uh, we, you talked about education. I think it's something you're going to, we've already been doing it. We'll continue to do it. We're going to up our game like we haven't before. Um, as much as we've done before, we're going to do more now. Uh, we also have just, so you know, also, aside from our website, which is the, uh, the SCA.com, T-H-E-S-C-A.com, we have an app that you that, that that on that app. Aside from getting information about our our what our classes are going to be, there are thousands and thousands of recorded classes of Torah and uh, everything related to Israel and educating yourself in, on on every level. And we hope that our community, and for that matter, other communities, um, utilize it. Uh, to, to whatever extent they would like. I just, want to, um, I just that, want to interrupt for a second and say that even though that all of this came from a horrendous tragedy, a horrendous uh, terrorist pogrom, mini Holocaust, that I get dozens of videos a day from Israel, predominantly in Hebrew. They are so inspirational. And I'm not a kid and I'm not naive. And it's not easy to get me, you know, I'm, I, you know, it's not easy to get me, to get me to, to buy into what you're trying to do in the video, but there is such an amazing religious Jewish Zionist. This is our house. This is our people's sentiment. One of the most powerful ones. Some of them are with guys with beards and payas, and some of them is a guy with a shaved head and a tattoo but they're saying the same things. It's unbelievable. Invoking the name of Hashem, invoking Am Yisrael, invoking our 3,300 years. It's every video I'm getting. It's, I haven't heard stuff like this from all types of Israelis. I've only heard it from you know one camp. It's unbelievable what's going on, really, in that's, that that's, sense. That's beautiful. And, that's and, that should, and that's something that should be inspiring to us as well. It's yes. very inspirational. It's, I'm not trying to be uh, trite. It's biblical. Some of the videos I'm watching are biblical. I feel like Yoshua Ben Nun is talking to me. Really inspiring stuff. It's beautiful. And I think, I think uh, yes, and uh, no question that uh, we've seen a lot of these as well. I feel very, very, uh, 
uh, very much the same. I think, how do you think well, the, what's, what do you think their response has been to our um, activity? I'm going to tell you one story and then just you know, let me know if there's more to say. I have a son who was called up for the reserves. I have one son who lives in Israel. Uh, he was he's in a he was in the regular army. He was in infantry, but now he's in a border patrol Mishmarag Vul reserve unit. So they were called up on the first day, October seventh. He woke me and my wife up at four a.m. October seventh, and my life has not been the since, uh, same since. And um, his unit basically jumps from event to event to event. Uh, they operate within the borders of Israel. And their job is to find and engage the enemy whenever they can. So he doesn't have a lot of time to talk. And there are a lot of hours that we're waiting and it's not so easy. And he has, but I, I put him on both chats. So when he has time, he sees all the stuff, you know, we're collecting stuff in Young Israel. We're bringing stuff in Great Neck. We're doing this over here. They're saying to Helium over here. So he's the only American born soldier in his entire unit. This is a real Israeli unit. He's also the youngest guy. Everybody is mid to late 20s, early 30s. One guy's in his 40s. They barely speak English. So one day, my son decided last week to show them what is going on on the American, you know, um, WhatsApp groups. Some of them teared up. They, they teared up. They couldn't believe that that's what we're doing in America. And then my son took time out from his work. It's the only thing he's ever posted in this whole war. So I just want to share with you. He, he, you know, he described who he is. And, you know. and then he said, I want you to know that what you put on your WhatsApp groups inspired the guys in my unit so much brought some guys to tears and it was it was like wind in their sails wow. and, and and that you can magnify that and a thousand times with other stories but what we're doing is really affecting them in such a positive way well, i think that i think that's a, a beautiful beautiful way to to uh end this amazing discussion and uh, again, um, Rabbi, we are extremely grateful for you taking the time out and, and coming and, and I'm speaking with us grateful today. grateful for the opportunity. I'm grateful for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. And, 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 and really, I'm Yisrael Chai. I think we all feel it. I think there's a sense in the air that we are living in a very special time. And we're seeing the most beautiful parts of ourselves come out. And um, thank you. Thank you for everything. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.